Note of Fate. The fate of individuals, of nations, of the world, has often hung upon accident or upon decisions that made another way would have substantially altered the course of human events. What if fate had decreed that Julius Caesar had escaped assassination? Or suppose by a stroke of fate, Benedict Arnold's plot to betray America had actually succeeded? Yes, much depends upon a stroke of fate. And tonight we rewrite history as we present our conception of what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, instead of Aaron Burr killing Alexander Hamilton in their famous duel, Hamilton had killed Burr. Let us present an imaginary account of what might have happened had Hamilton killed Burr. An account that might have been written by Hamilton's Federalist Party colleague, Rufus King, once United States Senator from Massachusetts and Minister to England. A few minutes after 7 o'clock on the morning of July 11th, 1804, on the heights of Weehawken, New Jersey, two bitter enemies, my good friend General Alexander Hamilton, once Secretary of the Treasury, and Aaron Burr, Vice President of the United States, faced each other ten paces apart. Then... Alexander. Yes, my dear. Oh, they're saying the news is all over the city. Is it true? What news, Eliza? That you fought a duel with Aaron Burr this morning. They say that he's dying. Then, then it is a mortal wound. I had hoped that it were not. Oh, if anything had happened to you, I don't think I could have gone on living. Oh, my darling wife. Alexander, how did all this happen? There was a story in the Albany Register. It reported a private conversation of mine in which I said I thought Burr was too dangerous to be trusted with the reins of government. Burr asked for a denial. But couldn't you have... How could I deny it without making myself out to be either a liar or a coward? Burr demanded satisfaction. And this morning? Well. The death of Aaron Burr shocked the country. Hamilton's supporters and our Federalist Party, of which he was a leader, rose to his defense. I went to see him to offer my advice. But I disagree with you, Rufus. Hamilton, you must leave New York City at once. I will not do it. Alexander, please listen to Mr. King. You must. You're certain to be indicted for murder. But a duel isn't murder. We both had the same chance. Had this bullet struck me, I'd be dead instead of Burr. Why this outcry? Burr was vice president. And Jefferson... Oh, yes. Jefferson, the hypocrite. Wails about this great loss to our country, and, and he detested Burr. Yes, yes, but he's too good a politician to miss this chance. Jefferson thinks this is the perfect opportunity to destroy you and with you the Federalist Party. With one stroke, he wipes out his rival and the opposition. Alexander, please accept Mr. King's invitation to be his guest. Hamilton, if, if you have no regard for your own safety, at least think of those to whom you're dear, your children, your wife, your friends. Why, what? What's that? There's a crowd of people in front of our house. I'll speak to those ruffians. No, no, let me. Hang the murderer, you say. Who is this gentleman for whose blood your part broke so first? Were you not a short while ago his warmest admirers? Go! Go, ye holiday, ye sunshine friends, ye criers of hosannas today and crucify us tomorrow. Go hide your heads, if possible, from the contempt and detestation of every virtuous and honorable man. Alexander, please, please, dear, Mr. King is right. Leave the city for now, I beg of you. Hamilton went to Boston and waited for the storm to subside. And the indictment of murder against him for the killing of Aaron Burr was dropped. Six months later, 1805, at Hamilton's home in New York again. I tell you, Rufus, I cannot stay in New York. Here they still think of me as the killer of that great man, Aaron Burr. My family is scorned. I have become, become a liability to our party. And I cannot content myself with being a mere lawyer. Well, what do you intend to do? 
to colonize the Louisiana Territory. What? Jefferson bought it. I'll colonize it. Are you serious? Look at this map. From New Orleans, along the west of the Mississippi, as far north as Canada and then westward. Hundreds of thousands of square miles of fertile land. Yes, but even if you do... I'm I... forming a company to finance the venture, to send men and supply them with equipment, food, and seed. I want you to help raise money for this undertaking. It can make all our fortunes. Yes, yes, it might, but it will take a great deal of money. Wait. Daniel Clark in New Orleans might be the man to help us financially. He's rich and has imagination. I'm going to New Orleans to see him. Mr. Clark, gentlemen of New Orleans, that is my enterprise. Will you join me? Mr. Barstow. Uh, General Hamilton, under ordinary circumstances, I would myself subscribe $20,000 to your venture. And why are you hesitating, Mr. Barstow? Because the Spaniards to the west of the Louisiana Territory are still hopeful of getting it back again. Now, suppose they do. Then what happens to the settlers we send out and to our investment? Jefferson will never give back the Louisiana Territory. Yes, but will he fight to keep it? If he won't, Mr. Clark, we will. Jefferson's a fool. Why doesn't he declare war with Spain? We've already had brushes with the Spanish soldiers near New Orleans. The frontier's wild with anger. We should attack the Spaniards and push them back from our borders. Push them back, Mr. Clark? Why not push them out? Well... That's the kind of talk I like to hear. Take the Spanish territories for the United States. Texas, the Floridas, reach out for California. The United States, bordered on the east by the Atlantic and on the west by the Pacific. What a great conception. Uh, yes, but uh, General Hamilton, Spain would send soldiers to drive us out. Spain is weakened by her war in Europe. She can spare no men to defend her territories here. And the few soldiers who are in the territories... We can take care of them. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Sooner or later, we must be in possession of those lands. Now, why not now? The people within them will support us. We can send men into those Spanish lands, many men. We can give out that they were settlers. I myself will command this expedition. General, I'm for it. I'm for it heart and soul. Gentlemen. <laughs> gentlemen, you're the leaders of the New Orleans Volunteer Defense Corps. Now, how many of these men do you think would be with us? Almost every one of them. Good. Now, it must be given out that they are merely going to settle farther to the southwest, within the Louisiana Territory. We'll organize other bands of men of like mind, and they'll rendezvous here in New Orleans. General Hamilton, this will take more money and arms than we can supply. Or your friends either, I dare say. I think... I think I know where I can get the arms and the money. <laughs> Hamilton, this... Oh, this is madness. Rufus, I leave New York tomorrow for the capital to see Mr. Mary, the minister of Great Britain. Oh, be careful, my friend. You're taking a great risk. You might find yourself accused of treason. General Hamilton, your proposal is very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Mr. Mary, as the British minister to this country... I'm sure that you can see it is not only interesting, but practical. Yes. But uh, could you enlighten me as to why Great Britain should supply you with arms and money? Of what advantage would it be to Britain if you were to seize the Spanish territory? Anything that weakens Spain is to your advantage. Your country is at war with Spain in the old world. Hmm. General Hamilton, do you plan to join these new lands with the Louisiana Purchase and the Western States in a separate republic? No, I have no such intention. Haven't you, General? One might consider that uh, you'd been very badly treated by your countrymen since your unfortunate duel with Colonel Burr. One might consider that, yes. You're a very clever man, General Hamilton. Very clever. If Great Britain will help me carry out my plans, your Canadian fur trade will be protected. And I can promise you other advantages. Yes. Well, General, I will convey your proposal to London. You're a very clever man, General Hamilton. Very clever. So 
Sometime later, the Spanish minister to the United States paid a formal and angry visit to President Jefferson. Mr. President, I wish to protest this outrage, this invasion of our territory by American armed bands led by this madman Hamilton. I am informed that the flag of the United States now waves in Texas, that shiploads of armed men landed in Monterrey, and that they now claim all the land on the Pacific coast for your country. Hamilton says everything between Texas and California belongs to the United States. Mr. Jefferson, what these men have taken must be given up, and General Hamilton must receive a more severe punishment so that no other adventurer should have the desire to imitate him. The representations of the Spanish minister aroused Jefferson to a fury. The president issued a proclamation in which he charged Alexander Hamilton with treason to the United States. We received this proclamation at our headquarters in Texas. So I am to return to Washington to face a trial for treason. Treason? Tom Jefferson would have me hanged, would he? You notice in this proclamation he says nothing about returning these lands to Spain, which, as he says, I seized without knowledge of our government. If you go back now, they will hang you. To them, you're still the man who killed Aaron Burr. I've got to clear myself of this charge of treason. Besides, I, I miss Eliza and my family. And as for being hanged, Rufus, I have great confidence in the ability of my chief attorney. Your chief attorney? Oh, yourself. Alexander Hamilton returned east and was indicted on a charge of treason. Pending his trial before Chief Justice John Marshall, he was confined to a building on the outskirts of Washington. Eliza, my dear. Alexander. What? Another basket of food? And it includes two bottles of your favorite claret. Thank you. But you must think I'm being starved here. <laughs> ah, I see you have the newspapers I've requested. Thank you. you should not read them. They say such dreadful things about you. Ah, this one already has me convicted, hanged, and, and you a widow. It also calls me a liar, a double-dyed traitor. How can anyone believe you to be a traitor? Have they forgotten what you've done for this country? Oh, my dear, I wish you were trying this case. Ah, the Chronicle. What's this? News has reached us of a letter written by the traitor Alexander Hamilton to the effect that he desired to set up a republic in the West with himself as the ruler. But, but that couldn't have been your plan, Alexander. Of course not. This is most unfortunate. This... this will hurt you. Perhaps, but... No. We'll show them. By heaven, we'll show them. You will please continue, Mr. Hay, Your Honor, and gentlemen of the jury, the government will prove that General Alexander Hamilton, who at one time bore a name honored by all his countrymen, this man who killed our vice president, fell to becoming an unscrupulous adventurer, conspired and seized land from a nation with whom we are at peace, with the foul purpose of also seizing the Louisiana Territory and subverting some of our western states to secede and to join him in setting up a new nation with himself as president. <laughs> I shall order the courtroom to be cleared. You may continue, General Hamilton. Among other matters, I am accused by the prosecutor of seizing the territory of a friendly nation, when the fact is, at that time we were engaged on our frontiers in an undeclared war with Spain. We had been attacked, and the best way to forestall such attacks was to seize the territory of the aggressor. We did this for love of our country and for no other reason. Take note that the United States government has not as yet returned to Spain those territories we won. If you convict me, you must return those lands to Spain, for you cannot call what I did a crime and then enjoy the fruits of that crime. While General Hamilton is still on the stand, I wish to introduce as evidence a copy of a letter which has come into our possession written by Mr. Merrick, 
the British Minister to the United States and addressed to Mr. William Pitt, the British Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Hay, do you have Mr. Mary in court prepared to testify? Uh, no, Your Honor, we have not. Then you should know this letter cannot be admitted as evidence. Your Honor, the contents of that letter have become public knowledge and have indeed led to prejudging this case against me. If it please the court, I request permission to make a statement concerning it. As you please, sir. Gentlemen of the jury, at no time did I ever inform Mr. Mary that I intended to set up a new republic or that we would attempt to seize the Louisiana Territory by force or try to engage the Western states to secede and join such a republic or monarchy. Mr. Mary states in his letter that that is exactly his understanding of what you intended to do. I am not responsible for the British minister's understanding or lack of it. General Hamilton, is it your contention that the British government is so charitable as to give you money and arms without her receiving far greater benefits than merely having an enemy deprived of some of her territory? I did mention trade advantages, which I felt sure this government would grant to England and Canada. General Hamilton, I accuse you of seizing the Spanish territories and conspiring to seize territory of the United States for the purpose of joining Canada and extending the frontiers of the British Empire. That, sir, is a lie. <laughs> what do you expect me to do, General? Call you out for that remark so that you, a practiced duelist, I am might... not on trial for the shooting of Aaron Burr in a duel. I did not say that you killed the Vice President of the United States. Your Honor! Oh, hello, Rufus. Hamilton, you... You sound discouraged. Tired. A month of this trial. More than a month of being confined to this this prison. Well, tomorrow will be the end of it. And of me. Not one witness that they've called has given the slightest confirmation of their charge against you. But that jury, I I have a feeling about juries, Rufus. It's a hanging jury. Oh, I, I, I don't agree with you. I have been prejudged, convicted before I was even tried. They cannot forget Burr. Don't let Mrs. Hamilton see you're dispirited. Eliza. Alexander, my dear. Now, what have you in that basket? A couple more bottles of claret? Only one, Alexander, which you may share with Mr. King. You'll have all the claret you desire when we go home. Home. It has a good sound, hasn't it? Here's a message from your friend, Mr. Pinkney. He, he asked me to give it to you. Thank you, my dear. Well, look at this, Rufus. Maybe we're not beaten yet. Gentlemen of the jury, do you think it possible that I, who was General Washington's aide, who helped fashion the Constitution, which is the framework of the very government I am accused of betraying, do you think it possible I could commit such an act of treason? I am accused of intending to establish a new republic or monarchy and of uniting it with Canada. If this were my intention, how strange it is that the American flag now waves over land we fought for and won. And now, as I learned from a message yesterday, there's a plan in Congress to indemnify Spain for this territory we now occupy. We will buy it. Texas, the Floridas, California, and all the land on the Pacific. So without question, it will be forever ours. Clear the courtroom. Please continue, Mr. Hamilton. I have little more to say. My only crime is that I visioned the United States stretching her borders and reaching to the Pacific Ocean. I envisioned her taking these lands now, not going to war over them later. If it is a crime to wish my country strong, to follow the glorious path that destiny has mapped for her, then I stand convicted and will gladly hang. <laughs> jury found Hamilton not guilty.
After the trial, Hamilton returned to his home in New York, where a crowd gathered outside and clamored for him to address them. As he finished speaking... Thank you, my friend. Thank you. They're, they're glad you were acquitted, Alexander. Truly glad. The same crowd that wanted to mob me after I shot Burr. Well, that is all forgotten. You're a popular man, my friend. What are your plans now? To rebuild our party first. Then, well, Tom Jefferson's term runs out in about a year. I believe this country needs a really strong president. You are listening to another episode in our new series, Stroke of Fate, in which we show how fateful decisions and accidents might have changed history. Now, it is our pleasure to introduce our history consultant on tonight's program, the noted historian, author of The Presidency, The New World, and Lincoln, a picture story of his life, Mr. Stephen Laurent. As we know, it was Alexander Hamilton who lost his life in that duel, and not Aaron Burr. But suppose fate had willed it otherwise. Suppose it had been Hamilton's bullet that killed Burr then tonight's story might have been an actual one instead of a flight of imagination. Hamilton could easily have been embroiled in such a plan. A few years before the duel, when he was inspector general and in command of the army, he urged that the United States should take Florida, Louisiana, and other Spanish lands. At that time, he wrote letters to the adventurer General Miranda, who asked for English and American help to liberate the South American continent. And Hamilton wished to be the man to take from Spain all her domains in the New World. Had he succeeded, he would have probably become president following Jefferson in 1809. As such, he would have advocated a strong federal government. Under him, the country would have been governed by the well-to-do, the aristocrats. And American democracy as we know it would never have come about. We might never have had presidents like Andrew Jackson or Abraham Lincoln. But we must never forget Alexander Hamilton's enormous contributions. A soldier in the revolution, a secretary of the treasury, Aaron Burr's bullet snuffed out a life whose greatness will always be remembered. Thank you, Mr. Loran. We invite you to listen again next week to hear what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, Marie Antoinette, Queen of France, had escaped the guillotine. Featured in tonight's Stroke of Fate presentation were John Barragray as Alexander Hamilton, Maurice Wells as Rufus King, Louis Van Ruten as George Hay. Others in the cast were Marie Stroud, Wendell Holmes, Humphrey Davis, John Stanley, and William Griffiths. This is Lionel Rico speaking. Stroke of Fate is produced by Martin Lester Lewis, conceived and written by Mort Lewis, and directed by Fred Way. This is the NBC Radio Network.